everybody. I see the picture I sent. I actually had the same necktie. That's amazing. I think I must, uh, I guess I only wore, own one necktie. Uh, <laughs> All right, good. Well, I wore it for you all today. So uh, nice to see so many new friends and uh, old friends and uh, colleagues. Um, it, this is really great. Magali and I have known each other for, for several years, and all of our, everything she touches turns to gold or, or something equally interesting. So um, I'm looking forward to seeing where this goes. Um, okay, so what I'm going to tell you about is the approach that our group, the Center for Neuroscience and Regenerative Medicine at NIH and Uniform Services University is taking with regard to clinical trials for traumatic brain injury. I'm going to tell you the kind of the big picture perspective of our basic strategy, and I'm also going to get into one example, very small trial, which I think illustri illustrates some of the ideas that Magali was just talking about involving personalized medicine, because it's a personalized medicine approach to one of the major sequelae of traumatic brain injury. OK. So, um, these are my disclosures. Um, I don't have any conflicts of interest with regard to this talk. Um, and uh, some of the ideas that I'm going to talk about today are also uh, form a, a portion of the foundation of the concussion care manual. So if anybody, you know, if anybody's interested in more about these ideas about what's out there now and what sort of common practice for taking care of patients with concussion in, in the real world are, um, it, that might be uh, something to check out. I'm happy to send you guys a free electronic copy of this. Um, and the usual military disclaimer, the USU disclaimer, this is just Dave Brody, not DOD or anybody else. Um, okay, so in terms of uh, our overview of what we're going to talk about today, one, the first one is a call to action for traumatic brain injury research. So um, Many of you already are very familiar with the pitfalls of the failed trials in traumatic brain injury, and I'm going to present an overall framework of one possible approach towards um, going forward. With it. That's the, uh, the one bite at a time uh, approach. And then the second, I'm going to give an exemplar. So uh, this comes from the Creighton Adams, General Adams quote, when eating an elephant, take one bite at a time. Um, so we all would agree generally that uh, TBI is sort of like an elephant, right? It's very large and it feels different in different places. Or are we the blind men or, or what? Um, so the idea of this call to action for TBI research is as follows. Um, we know that there's been many trials that have, have not generated a therapeutic. Um, there's been lots of reasons for this, potentially the animal model issue, the sample size issues, the heterogeneity, the trial design, patient selection, outcome issues. In, in the end, we have very few solutions. Um, and most of our treatments in the book, for example, that we use are based on, quote, clinical experience, which has been defined as making the same mistake over and over again with increasing confidence. <laughs> So um, that's what we do, and, and you'll see, in, in, for example, in the concussion care manual, um, one of the things I said in the introduction is that this is not ev about evidence-based medicine. If it was evidence-based medicine, it would be very short and not very useful. So uh, it really is most of what we do when patients come to our clinic is based on experience. Um, I do think we're doing a good job taking care of many of aspects of our patients, but we cannot say that we have a solid evidence base for a lot of what we do. Um, so some potential solutions that we consider. Um, additional large acute phase trials in moderate to severe TBI. Um, this approach has not been successful so far despite substantial effort. It doesn't mean it'll never be successful. There could be a magic bullet that will arrive or a, a magic treatment that will arrive that will in fact make a major difference in this space and it's not to say that we should abandon it, but it hasn't been successful so far. Um, we could focus heavily on prevention, and there's an area where I think we actually have made some progress. I mean, cars are much safer and bicycles are much safer. I just came in on my, uh, my concussion-reducing helmet on bicycle today. There are helmets that reduce rotational acceleration. Uh, I'll show you guys this if you want. Um, so prevention is a real thing, and that's really important. I, I don't want to deny the importance of, of prevention. Um, we could uh, slump into nihilism. Uh, the squash bug problem. You know, I was told by an institute director when I started my field as a young neurologist in traumatic brain injury, ah, see that? That's traumatic brain injury. That's a squash bug. You're never going to fix that bug, are you? Uh, so go into something else, like something more tractable like Alzheimer's disease. <laughs> You all laugh now, but in, 1990, in 2000, when I was finishing medical school and uh, graduate school and starting residency, we all thought Alzheimer's disease would be a snap. We had the genetics, and we were just like a, just a stone's throw away from having it all wrapped up. Look how well that worked out. 
So just because we have genetics does not mean it's a straight shot. <laughs> just, just saying. Just say. <laughs> okay, so uh, no, the nihilism, the squash bug approach, we're all in this room because we are not in the nihilistic squash bug camp. Um, we could double down on basic science research and dig harder and harder into the laboratory for the magic bullet, for the perfect pathophysiological mechanism that will really nail this problem or these subsets of problems. And again, I do not deny that that's important. That is critically important, but that's not enough. And Finally, the, do, the domain that I'm going to tell you about today is clinical trials focused on one issue, one symptom, or one subdomain at a time. And that's what we mean by one bite at a time. Okay, so the goal for that approach is to identify specific subdomains, symptoms, and candidate treatments that are amenable to clinical trials. Not taking on TBI as a whole elephant, but taking on one bite at a time. So each treatment each would be the focus of rigorously designed multi-center randomized blinded controlled trials. And here's a few small success stories in that line. So phenytoin and levetiracetam are indicated for early seizures in acute, moderate to severe TBI. It's not that they affect TBI as a whole. It's just for seizures and it's just for the subgroup of patients that have an increased risk of seizures such as moderate to severe TBI. Uh, amantadine has a small effect in recovery of consciousness in very severe TBI. It's not for all TBI, it's only for the people on the most severe of end of the spectrum who have disorders of consciousness. Um, methylphenidate has a modest effect on a post-acute attention deficit. It's not for all aspects of TBI, it's in the, only in the chronic phase and only for people that have, uh, have attention deficit. Yet we use it a lot in our clinic and it is quite effective for, for people with attention deficit in the right, in the right hands. Um, Repetitive transcranial magnetic stimulation has been getting a lot of attention recently for its treatment in headache and disorders and also in depressive disorders following TBI. There's been several publications, including one from my lab, and I'm going to show you that in detail. That's the, the personalized medicine trial that I'm going to show you uh, in just a few minutes is a repetitive transcranial magnetic stimulation guided by individual resting state functional connectivity. So it's a personalized approach to TMS for TBI. And then finally, melatonin for insomnia in some TBI patients has a small, modest effect just in patients that have sleep disorders after some types of TBI. So these are you know, very modest little bites, but they're all successful clinical trials. These are all randomized controlled trials that demonstrated a benefit. Not for TBI as a whole, but for one bite of the elephant. They didn't take a very big bites. Each of these was a very small bite. Um, Okay, so to do this, if we're going to, if we're going to envision this many bites of the elephant approach, um, what do we need? We need infrastructure. We need a clinical trials network. Uh, we need a single IRB we, uh, to, to get these things through. We need design features that are more advanced than the ones we're currently using typically. Bayesian adaptive design is really kind of the hot target right now for moving quite quick trials through quickly. I know you guys are doing this in PTSD. We're gearing up to do a major uh, adaptive design trial in uh, traumatic brain injury. Um, and we need to be able to identify the subsets of patients that are most likely to benefit. And that could be, you know, we could take an open-minded approach to that, right? That could be based on a blood biomarker or an imaging biomarker, but it could be based on a history that you take from the patient, a specific set of symptoms that they have or a family history that they have. It doesn't have to be something technological to be a good subdivision for how to enroll the right patients in the, in the trials. Um, and we need domain-specific primary and secondary outcome measures. So if we're focusing on headache, we use a headache-specific outcome measure. We're not going to try to use a global outcome measure. We're going to take one bite at a time. We're not going to ask how many elephants did you swallow. We're going to ask how many bites did you take or how, much, how big was your bite. Um, so overall, we think that this, treat, this strategy will uh, reduce the times and costs and logistical barriers associated with doing individual trials. Right now, a lot of the trials are very large and very expensive. We think we can do many smaller, cheaper trials using this approach and take lots of little bites along the way. All right, I'm going to stop saying bites of the elephant. I've done that enough. Um, so the goal, our goal, our big, hairy, audacious goal is to do 30 trials over the next 10 years for the cost of 10 trials, typical trials. And um, that idea, the idea of having to do, of doing 30 trials is based directly on the cancer literature. When we look at a field where things have gone well, like 
pediatric leukemias and lymphomas. We've really nailed those. I mean, the, the natural history is dramatically different for pediatric leukemias and lymphomas now than it was in my parents' generation. It was a death sentence and now, and people routinely survive. And the reason for that is because we've took many, many, many trials. We've done a very large number of trials in pediatric leukemia and lymphoma. Not all of them have been very big. A lot of them have been quite small. Sometimes you can do a trial with five or 10 patients and it can really move the needle. In, uh, in that field if it has a dramatic effect. But the point is that it's not that we do these mega trials. We do many, many steps along the process and that's been very effective in that field. Um, the Laskarites were famous for that when they had a good biomarker, the bone marrow aspirate uh, of the number of leukemic cells. They could use that marker to see whether their treatments were having effect much faster than they could by looking at whether the patients lived or died. They, could, they had a quantitative biomarker and that was a major step forward. Okay, so um, here, now I'm gonna, I'm gonna show you, this is from an editorial that we uh, have under review that hopefully should be coming out soon. Um, it's just some examples of what we mean in this domain. I think I've already illustrated it a little bit, but I'm just gonna go through these examples just so you can see very explicitly what we're talking about in terms of the size of the, of the individual um, uh, bites that we'd like to take and, and the sorts of domains that we're thinking about. So across the top is some examples of the domains we're thinking about, mood disorders following traumatic brain injury. So in our studies and in many others, mood disorders are the single strongest correlate of overall global outcome after traumatic brain injury. Depression is the big one, post-traumatic stress, anxiety, other mood, irritability, are other mood disorders that are common. And that's the, that's the big one. That's the biggest part of the elephant in terms of outcomes after TBI. Um, sleep disorders, another major problem, and a lot of the contributions to cognitive impairment often have to do with uh, sleep impairments and, and the delayed risk of neurodegeneration. Post-traumatic headache is the most common presentation in most TBI clinics. Most of our patients are coming to us in the delayed phase complaining about uh, headache or, or headache-related disorders. And these are often migranous, and they often have interesting neurological auras. Um, and TBI-related cognitive disorders. A lot of our, one of the other really cogn common complaints is difficulty with memory and concentration. We've heard about that um, today. Uh, actually, and, uh, and so that's something, that's a, these are very, and again, specific subdomains. So along the column now is some of the different potential therapeutic domains that we could consider. So therapy, cognitive, I've often asked, well, you know, what are the drugs for TBI, especially by neurologists? What, what, we don't have any drugs for TBI. Well, that's right, but if we only focused on drugs, we would only be offering one third of the therapeutic pie. We also want to focus on therapy, cognitive behavioral therapy, physical therapy, occupational therapy, behavioral therapies. These can be very effective, and that's another big piece of the pie. And then um, lifestyle modifications is another large piece of the pie. And so doing trials of lifestyle modifications is a very valid approach, and there's been many successful examples in, the, in this and other domains. So therapy on the top line, things like cognitive behavioral therapy. We're doing a smartphone app for depression that'll give cognitive behavioral therapy for depression using a smartphone app. Cognitive behavioral therapy can be very effective in some patients, but it is not very accessible. Something like 75% of the military service members in our research studies have not had access to high quality cognitive behavioral therapy. It doesn't matter how well it works, it's just not available for our patients. Um, so a smartphone app brings the therapy to the patients where they are. Um, brief behavioral therapy for insomnia. If you focus right away after the injury, somebody who's not sleeping well, immediately after their injury, you do brief behavioral therapy right after their traumatic brain injury, will that improve their insomnia? Will that bend the course of their post-TBI recruitment? We don't know, but we're gearing up for that trial. Um, CBT for migraine. There's, a, there's very specific behavioral changes that people can make for migraine, and again, that's amenable to cognitive behavioral therapy. Uh, Computer-based brain training fitness for working memory, I know an area that is very much on, on, um, in the eye of places like the NICO, where this is a part of the routine care, and how can that be made more advanced and, and, and even improved, and what, uh, how can we further develop the evidence base for that? So therapy is a big focus. Another big focus is neuromodulation. And so neuromodulation, but what we mean by that is things like transcranial magnetic stimulation. And I'm gonna tell you quite a bit about that uh, in the following slides. But transcranial magnetic stimulation and, alternative, and alternatives like uh, alternating current stimulation, vagal nerve stimulation, uh, direct current stimulation, can be applied to a lot of different areas. There are lots of trials going on in uh, stimulation domain for various aspects of traumatic brain injury. And that, that's a really exciting field. Um, pharmacology, of course, 
this is what we mostly think of, and just because we think of it mostly doesn't mean it can't be used in different ways. So in addition, although there aren't any FDA-approved drugs for traumatic brain injury, there are lots of FDA-approved drugs that are repurposed for traumatic brain injury that we use all the time. We don't necessarily have a great evidence base for them. And so the thing to, that we'd like to do is to develop the evidence base for repurposed drugs that have very good safety records and very good efficacy records in other domains and lots and lots of experience. So like for example, lamotrigine is, a, is an, is an anti-epileptic drug that has mood stabilizing properties. And we use it all the time in our clinic for people that have mood instability following traumatic brain injury with no evidence whatsoever. If we had uh, it, we would love to do a randomized controlled trial of this and ask for an FDA indication for mood instability following traumatic brain injury. That would be terrific. That would move the needle if that were true. Our anecdotal suggestions, you know, again, anecdotes are <laughs> worth, an anecdote plus four quarters is worth about a dollar. Um, but, uh, but, but nonetheless, we, our anecdotal evidence is that it's very effective. Um, sodium oxabate for refractory insomnia. Um, CGRP antagonists for acute post-traumatic headache. We're gearing up for that trial right now. Long-acting stimulants for cognitive endurance. One of the things that I hear a lot from my patients is that I'm fine during a 20-minute test, but eight hours or 12 hours gets me. And so what do we do for that? We've never done a trial for cognitive endurance where cognitive endurance is the outcome measure. Long-acting stimulants it would be an area that we would be interested in. Um, Turning to the next row, the lifestyle modification rule. Um, lifestyle modifications can be dramatically effective in some patients anecdotally. Intense cardiovascular exercise can be one of the most in effective mood stabilizers on the planet. It's just how do we get our patients to do it? So trials of approaches to get our patients to do intense cardiovascular exercise, that's where we need evidence base. Um, progressive daily gentle cardiovascular exercise for chronic fatigue, very different from mood stability where you, got, you have very intense exercise versus sleep disorders where people have extreme fatigue where they cannot do ex intense exercise, but the approach would be a very gentle, gradual introduction of exercise just as is evidence-based treatment for chronic fatigue syndrome. So borrowing that one. Um, a dietary food trigger modification for post-traumatic headache. That's, that's a standard in the regular domain of migraine. It's never been tested to see whether it is more or less effective in post-traumatic headaches. It may be very similar. It may, it may just not be worth your time in, uh, in the post-traumatic headache domain. And then um, questions about diet for cognition. There's a lot of debate about the role of low refined sugar and ketogenic diets and low carbohydrate diets in, uh, in cognitive therapies. So another lifestyle. And of course, hybrids. I mean, we're very interested in um, TMS paired with cognitive behavioral therapy. We think it may be synergistic, greater than the sum of the parts. Um, and, and you know, you can read some of the other uh, combination therapies that we're talking about in the bottom. But this is meant to illustrate what we mean by the specific domains and the specific treatments with specific uh, outcome measures in, in those domains. Okay, so um, before we move into the next uh, section, I'm actually gonna pause for, uh, for, uh, for um, I'll go back. Um, oops, no, I went the wrong way. I'm gonna actually pause to see if uh, people have questions before I get into the examples. I hope that's okay, Magali, if we pause for questions. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And given that I still have 30 minutes, I, uh, I should be good. No, nobody, we just didn't start the clock, that's why. <laughs> we'll, we'll pass the microphone around. Um, my question for you is, um, in, in that example, uh, you mentioned an adaptive approach. Are you also intending it to be an adaptive platform program? So uh, an all-comers approach, a randomized to one of any one of these, is that the concept, or are these separate studies uh, adaptively designed? Oh yeah, that's a great question. So just to repeat the question is, are, are we thinking about an adaptive platform or individual adaptive trials? So um, uh, Magali, I love the idea of an adaptive platform and to have many different patients come in with, okay, pick one, which of these four are, is, are you the most concerned about? And then we'll put you into the portion of the platform where there's a trial that's going on uh, for you. Um, we would love to do that, but that's two steps forward. We'd like to be able to run one adaptive trial first. So that, I, I mean, 
I'm just a regular guy. I'm not like a boa constrictor that can open my mouth and swallow that large a bite at a time, right? I'm gonna take one smaller bite that I can handle. I love the idea, but I can't, I can't quite bite off that just yet. David, that's a great presentation so far. You know, in keeping with what you've been saying, I don't know how many people in the room are familiar with the recent uh, special issue of the American Statistician, which uh, I think fits beautifully with what you're saying, that this obsessive um, adherence to testing significance at the 0.05 level, the, that organization, which is the major organization for biostatistics, said that, that has been killing science in general, and it's specifically uh, bioscience. And it's something that I think if you're going forward with your small trial analyses, might be something in addition to adaptive platforms and adaptive design, really needs to be taken into consideration. And uh, I don't think anybody yet has, has realized the implications, so I'm just urging that maybe all of us need to take a look at that special issue, which just came out uh, in January 2019. There are 43 papers in it pointing to what, how, what and how uh, the uh, obsessive uh, focus on 0.05 statistics and, and, their, and its variance has killed uh, the ability to move forward in the way you're suggesting, which I strongly agree with, by the way. Well, thank you very much, Don. I think that's, you're very wise to point that out, and that's uh, something we should all carefully consider. So in our, just to, point, just to reiterate, the, the reliance on a, a strict 0.05 p-value may not be necessarily the best thing for moving the science forward. In the careful working through the adaptive trial design that we've been, um, that we're about to uh, get launched, um, we've done Bayesian adaptive, Bayesian simulations. And so really what we care about in the early phases of the trial is just what are the probabilities that this particular type of treatment is better than this other type of treatment. And so which one should have its randomization probabilities increased for the next phase of the trial and which ones should be downregulated and when is it time that the probability is so low that they can just be dropped out. So this smooth, continuous look at probabilities rather than a rigid yes, no, more than 0.05, less than 0.05, is, gives us a lot of flexibility to move through these clinical trials in a much more flexible, uh, faster, cheaper, and smarter fashion. So I, I completely agree with you. Um, the, in the end, when you do the simulations and you do the statistical power analysis, if things are really powerful, it's, it doesn't matter how you analyze the data, it comes out fine the same way. But when there are, when it's a little murky and when it's coming through, these Bayesian probabilistic designs are substantially more powerful. So, um, and I think that's the, that's the approach that we're, we're, we're gonna be taking for sure. David, hey, JB. Hey, JB. Come back, casualty care. Um, regarding your trial, um, you mentioned a little bit up there. Um, are you, speaking mostly about concussion, when you talk about TBI. Um, and how f are you talking about long after the, the concussion or immediate, or you're talking more trauma-related brain injury, or you're encompassing all of that? What do you see? So that's a great point, right? right? So if we, we're just, I'm just gonna go back to the elephant, right? The elephant has four legs, right? There's the front legs are the acute trial, the acute parts, and you've got acute concussion and acute moderate to severe TBI. And then you've got the back legs, which is the chronic part, all right? And you've got chronic concussion and chronic moderate to severe TBI. And we need to take bites of all of those legs, right? I, I broke my promise, sorry. <laughs> uh, I can't help it. Um, but peppering through this graph are examples of all four of those things. Um, so some of them are in the chronic phase, some are from the acute to subacute phase, some of them are really only a good idea in concussive TBI. So like patients that are at high risk of seizure, traumatic, uh, transcranial magnetic stimulation is not a good idea, it's not safe. So concussive is gonna be the main domain. But some of the other things like um, vagal nerve stimulation or calcitonin gene-related peptide or cognitive behavioral therapy, more severe patients could be, could be fine. Um, so yeah, it's a great question. And so we, we again, we divide it up into those, the, at least the way I think about it is in those four domains. We don't, it doesn't mean have to cover everything in every domain. We go for the things that are targets of opportunity or the best chances of success. All right, well in that case, I'm gonna move on to the exemplar if it's okay with you. And we can do more questions later. So here's the exemplar. 
Um, this is individual connectome mapping based transcranial magnetic stimulation for depressive symptoms in traumatic brain injury patients. The domain is mood disorders, the subdomain is depression, the population is concussive and moderate injury. We actually had a few moderate patients in this um, with, uh, with uh, depressive symptoms after traumatic brain injury. And uh, we use this individual transcranial magnetic stimulation, and I'll show you a little bit about that. The outcome was not a global outcome measure, it was the Montgomery Ashburg depression rating scale, which is very specific to depression, as an example. Um, so here, this is just for an introduction. Many of you know about this, but uh, just to make sure everybody's on the same page, transcranial magnetic stimulation is an FDA-approved therapeutic that involves a large uh, magnet that turns on ra very rapidly that induces a magnetic field in the brain, which induces electrical currents in the brain, which causes action potential firing, directly stimulates the cortex underlying the, the stimulator. Um, it uh, causes, for example, you can, you can, if you hold it up over the left motor cortex, you can get the right thumb to twitch, and you can map out the brain, like where the motor cortex is by moving this thing along the, the head, and it causes direct stimulation of the, of the, of the brain. So um, this, is, uh, this is very, uh, it's, it's FDA approved for depression, obsessive compulsive disorder, um, and, uh, and it's been in use for quite a while. So, um, but the interesting part of what we did is that we, um, the targeting is the tricky part. So it only targets one or two centimeter diameter uh, part of the brain. So you have to be really sure what you're targeting. The standard approach that's FDA approved is just to take the motor cortex and go five and a half centimeters anterior and stimulate there. And that stimulates, quote, the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex. So that's like saying America. Right? It's a big place. So uh, dorsolateral prefrontal cortex is large and complex and heterogeneous. So our approach is to map those regions with resting state functional connectivity. Standing on the shoulders of the giants who have done the human connectome project and a lot of the technology that my former institution, Washington University in St. Louis, developed to do individual subject resting state functional connectivity. Most of our work in the past with resting state fMRI has been at the group level where one group is compared with the other group, but the, 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 treat, the scans are, are usually too noisy to use at the individual subject level. We've gotten the technology down to the point where we can make a reliable map of an individual subject. It takes a lot more data and a lot more processing than the normal way of doing it. So great to collate lots of data from a lot of places, but a lot of that data is not going to be good enough quality. So this is, this, you know, you're, oftentimes we would do eight minutes or 10 minutes of resting state functional connectivity. We did 30 minutes of resting state functional connectivity on one of the world's best scanners, and we scrubbed the hell out of it. So of that data, any tiny movements or any irregularities in the data had to be automated, automated process knocked out, and we actually had to eliminate about uh, a third to half of the data, scrubbing it to get it clean enough to be able to make these maps that are, that are reliable. So this is not easy. This is not lightweight stuff. Um, Luckily, we had really terrific folks at WashU that could help us out with this. But what you get is these maps of these individual networks. And so, like, for example, the default mode network is mapped in red here in these, uh, in these individual subjects. And you can see there's quite a bit of variety from, uh, from subject to subject in where these maps are. So if you just picked an anatomical location on the brain, you would be stimulating a different network in different people at different times. And so that's why this is so important. What we did is we found the portion of the dorsal attention network that was the most anti-correlated with the default mode network in each individual subject. So we had to map the dorsal attention network and the default mode network and the relationship between the two and the, find the portion that was most anti-correlated. So the reason for that is that the subgenual anterior cingulate lying right underneath the corpus callosum is a portion of the brain that's been heavily implicated in depression. But itself, the subgenual cingulate is very difficult to map. It's a very noisy, challenging part of the brain and very hard to localize accurately. However, it correlates very well with the default mode network. So we use the default mode network as a surrogate for this thing that we want to target but can't map very accurately. So, um, and the, the dorsal attention network is the portion that is most anti-correlated. So if we want to down-regulate the subgenual anterior cingulate, our approach is to up-regulate 
the dorsal attention network because they're inhibitory of each other. So to inhibit this stuff over here, we want to stimulate something that inhibits it over there. So that's our basic approach. So you can't stimulate the subgenual anterior cingulate directly. It's too deep in the brain. You could do it with deep brain stimulation, but you can't do it with transcranial magnetic stimulation. So, but a principle for TMS is that just about every deep target has a cortical correlate that either correlates or anti-correlates that you can push on on the cortex in order to target your deep target. So that that's still remains to be tested, but that's, a, that's a, one of the paradigms that underlies this approach. So this is individual. Each individual subject got mapped. Um, this is our enrollment. It's a very small trial, as I mentioned. There's uh, 32 patients were, uh, were screened from my clinic in WashU in St. Louis. Uh, we enrolled 15 of them. Um, they all had Madras score greater than 10. They were all pharmacotherapy resistant. They had not benefited from drugs or cognitive behavioral therapy. And uh, we applied 20 sessions of bilateral transcranial magnetic stimulation using this rest individualized resting state targeting. Not all the scans worked the first time. Sometimes we had to bring the patients back for a second scan and remap and all that stuff. So, you know, this is, this is real work. Um, this is not an easy trial to do. But here's what we found. The, um, the, sh the, the active group had uh, generally a dramatic reduction in their Montgomery Ashberg depression rating scale over time, mid-treatment and post-treatment. And uh, the sham group did improve. This is a very powerful placebo. There's no question about it that coming in 20, having this really super high-tech scan and coming into the laboratory and having these really you know, nice people. Sean Siddiqui is a very nice person. Not me, I'm not, I wasn't. But uh, Sean Siddiqui is a very nice person. He's a trained psychiatrist. And his staff were very nice. And so they got a lot of attention. They got 20 hours of you know, attention from a really nice person. So, and, and all this technology. So needless to say, there was a real placebo effect. But the effects of the real transcranial magnetic stimulation were dramatically different. And the patients did not know. They were not able to guess whether they got real TMS or sham TMS. They, um, they, they, they all thought they were getting real TMS, basically. Um, and I think that's part of the reason that, they, that many of them improved. But this is uh, very gratifying to see and many of the patients started to engage in other therapeutics after their TMS session. So people who would not exercise before started exercising after. And people who would not go to cognitive behavioral therapy before started going to cognitive behavioral therapy after. People who couldn't quit alcohol or cigarettes before were able to take another try at quitting their substances of abuse after, anecdotally. Um, so uh, this also, produced uh, changes in, um, well, oh, let me show you the, some of the subscores first. So the, the subscores generally were all trended in the right direction. They all um, generally improved in, across all the subscores of uh, uh, Madras. The only one that was really significant, the one, the one that was the most significant was lassitude, that this idea of just being so low in energy that you just can't get up enough energy to do anything. And that was uh, substantially improved. That was the thing that improved the most relative to sham. And that, like I said, getting back and starting to do other things afterwards was, uh, was really dramatic. And so that's why I think of a hybrid approach maybe in the end the most effective, right? Because the TMS may reduce lassitude and then give people, allow people the energy to get back into doing other things that are going to be beneficial, that uh, the exercise or therapy or et cetera. Um, so uh, I'm not going to show the, I, I guess I don't have the slide on the, um, the resting state functional connectivity changes. This definitely changed the functional connectivity of the brain. When we did a post-stimulation scan, we could see the network architecture was remapping. It's not obvious which portions of the resting state network architecture are most correlated with the changes in symptoms. We had hoped that there would be a kind of a golden biomarker on the, on the scans that would show us, okay, who's responding, who's not responding. We don't quite have that yet. So if we had only relied on the biomarker, we would be in worse shape than relying on the patients to tell us how they're doing, because ultimately that's what we care about the most. So I don't want to, I mean, I think biomarker approach, biomarker driven approach is really important, but you can't always rely on a biomarker. Sometimes you just have to treat the patients in the specific subdomains. Um, okay, so now what? That was our pilot data, very promising. Needs to be replicated and needs to be extended. This is an example of the planning that's underway and get, getting, started, getting ready to start soon for a large multicenter <laughs> trial using Bayesian adaptive design for depressive symptoms after traumatic brain injury. 
And so some of the things we don't know are, is whether this really hard work based on resting state functional connectivity scans is of any benefit at all. So arms one through four on the bottom are the individual connectome targeting. We're gonna test, we're gonna, okay, some of the patients are gonna get individual connectome targeting. And we're gonna compare that with structural targeting. That's where you take an MRI scan and you target the area, the junction between Broadman area nine and 46, which is in the portion of dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, which is most associated with benefit in previous studies. So that's called structural targeting, structural MRI targeting. That's a lot easier. Still requires an MRI scan, but it's a lot easier than individual connectome targeting. And that's uh, arms five through eight. We're also gonna test scalp targeting. That's what's approved by FDA. And that's where you go five centimeters anterior to, uh, to the motor cortex. It doesn't require an MRI at all. Um, and that's arms nine through 12. So we'll test head to head in this Bayesian framework um, where the, uh, which targeting method is superior, or maybe they're all equivalent. Um, we also don't know whether unilateral versus bilateral TMS makes a difference. We did bilateral TMS in our trial but bilateral TMS takes a lot longer. Um, and so maybe unilateral TMS is just as good and we could bring it to more patients if we spent less time doing it. Um, so we're gonna test bilateral and unilateral and that's that laterality arm. And then finally, the protocol. The standard TMS protocol is 10 hertz on the left and one hertz on the right. Da, 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 you know, just hammering away. There's a new approach called theta burst, which is much faster. Instead of 30 minutes of stimulation, a theta burst uh, stimulation paradigm could be three or four minutes, so about 10 times faster. Recently, theta burst has been shown to be non-inferior to standard TMS for regular depression. We don't know whether it'll be same, better, worse in traumatic brain injury patients. So that's the protocol arm. This is incredibly complicated, right? There's 12 active arms and, and a sham group. This would be really hard to get through with a standard design, but with Bayesian adaptive design, what happens is that each of these arms gets 10 patients each in the beginning, and then we take a look. And we upregulate the, prob the randomization probabilities of the ones that are doing well, and we downregulate the randomization probabilities of the ones that are not doing so well, all in a fully automated, pre-specified fashion, right? We don't look at the data, the machine looks at the data. We're not unblinded. The machine looks at the data and adjusts these randomization probabilities in a fully automatic way. And this is much more, if it ran, lots and lots of computer-based simulations indicate that this, is a, that, this, that this works, this gets to the right answer when the, the right answer is positive. It does, not, it does not give false positive answers. It does not eliminate things based on early noise. Using a burn-in period of 10 per group is, real, is just right. Five per group is too noisy. You get too many things swinging off in one direction or another. 20 is more than you need. 10 is, uh, 10 is good. Um, so the total trial will have 440 patients in it, which in a standard arm would probably take twice or three, a standard approach would probably take about twice or three times that based on the statistical power. So, so this, is our, this is what we're gearing up for in this. Um, we'll find out uh, at the end of this trial if any of these really work and very efficiently which one is the best and if they're similar, we'll go with the one that's the easiest for the patients. That's to say that takes the least amount of time and the least amount of hassle for the MRI. Um, and we're fully committed to supporting the advanced MRI because uh, for all the, all the sites because that's, that's uh, not something. And even if, even if this is successful, we'll support the advanced MRI for the rollout if it gets rolled out into public because it's not something that a traditional radiology department can do. Okay, so to summarize, um, numerous late stage trials have not been successful. And uh, our one bite at a time approach addresses some of the shortcomings of previous trials while maintaining a rigorous scientific and flexibility using Bayesian adaptive trial designs. We think that overall time and cost investment for individual trials can be reduced using a network of partner clinical trial sites uh, overseen by a single IRB. One of the things I didn't mention is that uh, that multicenter Bayesian adaptive trial design is gonna be done at military treatment facilities and veterans administration and hospitals around the United States. And this is kind of our Welcome to the group trial. If the groups are, get along well and we run the trial smoothly and everybody communicates well, that lays the groundwork for future trials that we can all do together. We think of a lot of really great opportunities. The military treatment facilities and VA hospitals are, are, are flooded with patients who are looking for new opportunities and I think this is a, this is a great time to do it. 
So um, that's where we're headed. And I wanted to thank all of the people in the Traumatic Brain Injury Research Center at USU and uh, NIH who uh, have contributed to this and have been my, uh, my wonderful colleagues over the last uh, not quite two years that I've been in this position. So I thank you for your attention. Please. Yeah, those. <laughs> those are great questions. I'm going to ask you your, answer your second question first. Um, the grand majority of these patients, essentially all of them, are going to be chronic phase concussive traumatic brain injury patients. So patients with moderate to severe TBI have an increased risk of seizures after, uh, and and so we we and the FDA agree that we transcranial magnetic stimulation, which can result in seizures, is not as safe as we would like. So this is all concussive, in, all in the chronic phase. Um, and, um, but of course, that's a huge, there's a huge heterogeneity in that. There's people who have had one concussion and fell into depression afterwards, and people who have had hundreds of events. Um, and so yes, the ran that's the whole point of the randomization, is we just don't know who's more likely to have more uh, response to, to TMS and who's not. We're going to have a whole bunch of secondary analyses about who's more likely to respond and who's not. If we don't hit our primary outcome, we can look at those subgroup analyses and design an inclusion criteria for the next study based on that. But we think we're going to hit our primary outcome. So um, your first question um, was involved the, um, the severity of depression. And, and that's right. The randomization should uh, take care of that. And, and so that, that has been the case, that with uh, reasonable randomization approaches, um, that there will be uh, appropriate uh, balance in, in, in depression. But importantly, uh, let me go back to this. I didn't actually clarify. Well, anyway, I can illustrate it. Importantly, the primary outcome measure is not the final depression. It's the change in depression for that individual. Right. Exactly. So if you go from 40 to 20, that's terrific. Going from 20 to 10 is also terrific. All right. Thanks, everybody.